Now, by the end of this video, you're going to know all the basic risk management definitions. Now, this is important because I'm building a project on risk management, which is going to be dropping soon. These are the fundamentals that you need to know before that project. So make sure you pay attention. Also, the way I teach risk management is completely different to the boring textbook stuff you will see. So we're going to be learning about the definitions and everything else with like fun examples. OK, so we're going to get started. Now we're going to start off with the first of our problem. I've got a phone that's just too big for my pockets. It's really annoying and it's always kind of falling out and being a bit inconvenient and whatever else. But there's this one particular set of trousers that it's just too big for. However, I love that pair of trousers because a special auntie bought that for me. And that auntie makes me carrot cake every month. Okay. So, so far we've got phone, we've got trousers and I've got carrot cake. Great recipe for risk management. Anyway, so what I like to do is I like to wear these trousers at least once a year to go see my auntie. The way I remember it is just to wear it on her birthday. So every time I go to see her for a birthday, I wear these this pair of trousers. Now the problem is, over the past 10 years I've been doing this and going to see my auntie, I've actually lost two phones. So I've literally lost a phone every five years. Now bear with me while I kind of unpack that a little bit. So the risk here, the problem that's happening is that the phone keeps falling out of my trousers. However, I have to wear the trousers because I want my auntie to be happy and I still want to receive the carrot cake that she gives me every month. So what are my options here? Well, there's actually four different things we can do in this scenario. Now, the easiest thing to do would be risk acceptance i.e. I accept the risk that I have to wear the trousers, but it's going to fall out my pocket eventually, most likely once every five years or twice a decade. Now, if I accept that as a risk, then I'm carrying on doing what I'm doing with the awareness that my phone will probably most likely fall out of my pocket. And I can also avoid the risk. Now, to avoid the risk entirely, I wouldn't be allowed to leave my house technically because every pair of trousers has some degree or some chance that your phone will fall out because I do have a big phone and this is a first world problem. If I chose to avoid the risk completely, then I would never leave my house. But that's not practical in this situation, is it? So I've got two other options and one of them would be to transfer the risk. Now, you can transfer the risk, at least maybe from a financial level. So I could go out and buy some insurance, maybe Apple Care, that will cover the cost of the damage if my phone falls and the screen breaks or it gets damaged. However, anything I do lose on my phone that isn't backed up to the cloud will still be a loss and it can affect my reputation. So let me give you an example. Let's say my son had doodle jump on the phone and he's got a high score that's just stored locally. It's not backed up to game center or any cloud gaming or whatever. It's just literally on my phone, but he's got this high score that he's really proud of on doodle jump on my phone. But now I've just dropped, smashed the phone, it's broken, I have to get a new phone and he's lost his high score. Now he's gonna be upset with me and he's not gonna trust me to keep his doodle jump high score safe again, is he? Because I broke it. I lost that last time and I've lost his trust in me. So even if I transfer the risk, over to the insurance provider, there's still some aspect that would affect me. And the last option is mitigation. Now we can mitigate this in a number of ways. Maybe I could even get a piece of rope or rubber bands or whatever and tie it to my phone and trousers. I could maybe even put like a really bright phone case on there, like a bright yellow one. So if it does fall, I'll notice it. Maybe I could get a really thick case that's like drop proof. Maybe I could wear different trousers entirely that just have less of a chance. Maybe I could wear a pouch that I could put the phone into. Now these are different mitigation strategies to deal with the risk of my phone falling out my trousers. Now, each of those things will mitigate the risk in different ways. So that's generally how risk management works. You have these four core strategies to deal with the risks. You can transfer them, you can mitigate them in some way or another, you can accept them, or you can avoid them entirely. At some point in this project, I will move away from trousers and actually start talking about IT and security risks. But for now, I'm stuck on trousers and cake. And I'm gonna stay in that just to give you the definitions and examples. Now, so if you wanted to do some sort of analysis 
and the likelihood and the actual impact of this happening. There's two main ways we can do it. And these are two types of risk management. Now, one is called qualitative risk management and one is called quantitative risk management. I'll put an example up on the screen of qualitative risk management. Now, qualitative risk management, you can think of it almost like a finger in the air approximation to how bad something will be. Now, of course, it's a little bit more than that, but at a surface level, it's kind of like a light touch estimate approach to risk management. You literally pick a likelihood and a consequence. And these can be called many different things. Instead of likelihood, you can have probability. Instead of consequence, you can have impact or severity. So you'll see these kind of terms used. But generally, when you're looking at this, the likelihood, the amount of time something can happen and the consequence of it happening, how bad the impact is going to be. So if we think of it from the trousers and the phone perspective, how likely is it that my phone is going to fall out of my pocket? Now, what I said earlier was I've lost two phones in the last 10 years, okay? So if we look at that as one phone every five years for now, that's a 20% chance, one in five. To me, that's quite likely. Now, if we think of this from the qualitative risk management perspective, I can literally pick anything. It's based on my discretion as a risk advisor. However, I think it would be fair to say it's possible. It's not unlikely. So I'll give it a three, okay? Now, in terms of the impact, for me personally, if I broke my phone and it was out of use and it's catastrophic, I mean, it's a definitely a five. How am I going to play last day on earth? I mean, how am I going to message my family and make sure they're okay? <laughs> So it's important for me to have my phone. So if we just kind of do a simple math, three times five, it's 15, which is extreme. It's in the red zone. Now, the red zone is interesting because not every company has the same red zone. Some companies are actually more risk adverse. They're willing to take extra risk. So all these colors you're seeing aren't hard and fast rules that you have to have for some companies. Their reds might just be a 25. 120. Some companies or organizations might be like, nope, we're not accepting anything over a six. This just shows how a company would react and how seriously they would take it essentially. And this is a qualitative approach. Now you're looking at this, it's one to five. It's called the one to five risk model or risk matrix or whatever. However, there's a lot of different ones. There's one to four, one to three, one to five. There's like one, three, 10, 40. There's all these different random ways of like calculating risk. However, the most popular one you will see used and what 90% of people use is the one to five. It's simple, it's easy to understand, but it does have its problems. Before moving on to quantitative risk management, I'm just gonna quickly talk about some of the issues with this. Now, firstly, you can't differentiate between risks. So if you had like multiple risks, maybe dozens, and you were looking at them, and let's say you had 125 and 216s, which do you prioritize? Is it the 216s or is it the 125? Or let's say you had 312s, which do you prioritize? The 312s or the 125? You can't kind of add them up and combine them and actually work out what combination of risks are the ones to focus on and where investment should go. So that's one of the major issues is that it kind of looks at risks individually as opposed to having an individual risk score, but also being able to combine them and understand and assess how risks together, if materialized, are worse than other risks. So that's one of the issues. You can't add them up. You can't take them away. It's very difficult. You have to look at each risk in isolation and you have to kind of make a judgment call on those three risks are probably worse than that one. Let's focus on those three and leave that one for now. Or that one is the one we should focus on and let's ignore everything else. That's kind of what you have to do with qualitative risk management is you have to make very important judgment calls and it becomes very difficult. So that's one of the main issues I find with it is you can't combine them, add them and make proper judgment calls when you're looking at risk management. So another major issue with qualitative risk management is on the lower end, you've actually got a lot of options. You've got a lot of numbers like below 10. The only number you don't have is seven because it's a prime number. So you've got like one, two, three, four, six, eight, nine and ten all below 10, and then you've also got 12, which is only two above it. Then the next jump is 16, then it's 20, then it's 25. So at the higher end, you've got less options, and at the lower end, 
you've got so many different options and combinations of what those risks could equal to. Now, typically what most companies do is they'll say, everything below 10 or everything below 12 will just be accepted. And everything above that, we need to actually address and deal with. So wouldn't you rather have more granularity, more options at the higher end and less at the lower end? That's where it will be more useful. It kind of relates to the issue I was saying earlier with combining, etc. But if you could have a 24, a 23, a 22, a 21.5, that would actually be more useful at the higher end anyway. But unfortunately, with the one to five risk model, you don't have that level of granularity. All of that exists at the lower end. Anyway, enough about qualitative risk management. Now we're gonna talk about some more definitions and we're going back to the trial of thing to learn about quantitative risk management. Now, quantitative risk management works a little bit differently. We're actually getting a little bit deeper into the details of the value of things and the actual monetary impact of loss. But that can only be done if you have additional resources invested into it. Also, when you've got a big company that's got like a complex risk management qualitative framework, it becomes more the work of like a statistician or a math expert than it does a cybersecurity person. Because when you're dealing with money and monetary values and you're doing like equations and combinations and base 10 of whatever and it actually gets quite complex so it's good to have someone who's really good at math on the team just to help and make sure nothing's going wrong but anyway so first thing is asset value very basic term so on my phone let's just use whole numbers round numbers let's say it's worth one thousand dollars okay so that's the asset value that's what we're going to start with now the likelihood is seen as a percentage. So as we described earlier, I drop it once every five years. So the likelihood of me dropping it in any one year is actually 20% or one over five. So the likelihood is 20%. Let's just park that. Now the damage inflicted is the kind of money we lose at that point. Now what we call this in risk management is the SLE or the single loss expectancy, which means how much money will I actually lose if my phone falls out my pocket and breaks? Let's just use easy numbers and say that every time it falls out my pocket, it costs me $500 to replace the screen. So that's a single loss expectancy. I will lose $500 every five years from the phone falling out my pocket. However, what's the annual loss expectancy? And this is where risk management gets interesting and very beautiful in my opinion, because the annual loss expectancy is going to be how much money would you lose every year? And you're not losing money every year. You're losing money every five years because that's how often it's falling out my pocket. However, if I was going to be clever, what I would do is I'd actually put away a hundred dollars every single year knowing that after five years it's probably going to fall out my pocket and i've got that money set aside so my annual loss expectancy will be a hundred dollars because that's how much money i'm actually losing when this risk materializes which is a really important business concept that you've got to understand businesses have predictions for when things will happen how much money they will lose in the future and they start to plan for it early on and this is very important from a cyber security and it perspective anyway let's not get deep into that let's cover off a few more definitions now the other thing is the inherent risk now the inherent risk is where i started so i started off wearing trousers that my phone would fall out the pocket once every five years so that is what is classed as the inherent risk it's a risk that you started off with before you've done anything to it so another concept is a residual risk the residual risk is how much risk is left after i have added a mitigating control so for example let's say i've put it in a pouch or a man bag by now and the phone only falls out of that once every Every 10 years and the residual risk means that now there's a 10% chance of it falling out of my bag every year as opposed to 20. The single loss expectancy doesn't change because when it does fall out it will still cost me $500 however the annual loss expectancy has changed because now I'm only going to be losing $50 a year instead of 100. 
and the annual rate of occurrence of course is normally expressed as either a percentage or a decimal so it could be 0 0.2 meaning 20 percent or 1 over 5 for our inherent risk and for our residual risk it would be 0 0.1 or 1 over 10 or 10 percent so yeah those are the different terms we have within risk management we really need to understand these terms are so important in cybersecurity for so many different exams you will need to know this and also it's foundational to the projects that we're going to be doing going forward because i'm going to be doing some really fun risk management projects which is kind of the beginning of an even bigger project which is quite crazy to think about because this video is a precursor to a bigger cybersecurity project which is also the precursor to another bigger project so if you subscribe to this channel you'll definitely be getting some really cool cybersecurity projects in the near future. So make sure to stay tuned. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe. Over and out.